Hello again, I'm Ms. Davis, and today we're going to look at the evolution of Protus. Kingdom Protista is like the junk drawer of kingdoms. You know that junk drawer that you have somewhere in your house, like in the kitchen, or somewhere that has like a hodgepodge of stuff, like a bunch of pens that don't work, or batteries, or screwdriver, it just has a bunch of junk in it? That's what Kingdom Protista is. Um, Kingdom Protista contains eukaryotic organisms, which means that their cells have a nucleus. So this is the first group that we see where their cells have a nucleus. Also, these organisms are mostly unicellular, but again, there are some exceptions that are multicellular. Some are also heterotrophs, meaning they consume their own food. Others are autotrophs, meaning that they can make their own food. Most also go through asexual reproduction, but again, there are some exceptions and some go through sexual reproduction. So as you can see, this kingdom is very diverse. This group can be divided into three main groups. The animal-like protists, which are called protozoa, which you can see example here. The fungus-like protists, which are like your water and slime molds, example here. And finally, the plant-like protists, which are the algae. And again, here are examples. We're going to discuss the protozoans first. So these are going to be heterotroph via ingestion. They're gonna take their food into their bodies. Some of them are free living, such as zooplankton, but others are going to form what we call symbiotic relationships. Now, symbiotic relationships mean they're going to work with another organism. Some of these are going to be mutualistic, meaning that both organisms are going to benefit. Both get something good out of it. Others are going to be parasites where one benefits and the other is going to be harmed. And then the protozoans are going to be classified by the way that they move, by their type of locomotion. So let's start, start talking about the flagellates first. The flagellates are protozoans that move via flagella. Now remember, flagella are those tail-like extensions that allow them to swim. Euglenoids are the first type of flagellates we're going to talk about. They are free-living, freshwater, unicellular organisms, but they display both animal-like and plant-like characteristics. Now, some are going to be heterotroph. They have the flagella, but they have no cell wall. Others are going to be autotrophs, meaning they do photosynthesis, and they contain chloroplasts, which makes them green. They can store starch-like plants, and they have an eye spot, which you can see here in red in this, these examples. So this group, again, shows the confusion of this classification within protista, but the euglenoids are our first group. The next group of flagellates are parasitic, meaning they're going, to be in, they're going to benefit, but their host is going to be harmed. Trypanosomes are carried by insect vectors, so they're carried by insects and cause diseases that we will discuss here. Now, trypanosomes are masters of disguise. Um, they can hide in plain sight. They allow your immune system to detect them, and your immune system starts to build up attack against them. But by the time your immune system gets ready to attack, the trypanosome has changed. It changes its outer covering. The immune system then recognizes it doesn't belong and starts to make a new attack. Again, it changes before it can attack. So this cycle goes on and on. Now, African sleeping sickness is the first one. and It's transmitted by the testifly. An individual's affected start to feel run down from fighting the infection. It leads ultimately to a coma and then death. Now, treatment for this disease is very aggressive, and it can also kill the individual um, if the person is too weak. Chagos disease is the next one. It's transmitted by a blood-sucking beetle called the kissing bug. They're attracted to carbon dioxide, which is what we breathe out, and so they a lot of times come when you're sleeping, and they will bite you around your mouth or your face. This disease causes severe cardiac and digestive problems. The last one is leishmaniasis. This is transmitted by the sand fly. It causes skin sores and can sometimes cause damage to internal organs if it goes deeper into the body. Now the next parasitic uh, flagellate is the Jadera. Jadera are transmitted through a fecal oral route. Okay, this is due to the ingestion of contaminated water. So like if people don't wash their hands or you drink water that has been contaminated with feces, that's how it gets transmitted. And this, this group causes severe diarrhea. And you can see here how it has multiple flagella for movement. Trichinomus is the next group, and this is transmitted sexually. It causes vaginitis and urethritis. So these are the parasitic flagellates. The next group of protozoa are the amoebas, and they move through a pseudopod, which you can see here. A pseudopod means false foot. 
Many of these are free living in aquatic environments, um, like zooplankton would be an example of this. They use contractile vacuoles for water regulation, which also aids in their movement as well because they can push water out and they'll pull themselves forward. Now they engulf their food through phagocytosis and they ingest it inside of vacuoles. Okay, it's kind of like Pac-Man where they're coming in and they're like eating it up and taking it in. Um, some are parasitic and they can cause what we call amoebic dysentery. And if they invade the liver or brain, it can be fatal. Okay, and this again comes from drinking contaminated water that has these guys in it. The next group are the ciliates, and they move via cilia, those hair -like, small hair-like extensions. This group includes the parameciums. Many of these are also free living in aquatic environments, and they also have contractile vacuoles like the amoebas do. But they take their food in through an area called the gullet, and then they produce these food vacuoles where they digest it. They also have an anal pore which they use to secrete their waste. Now, this group possesses two nuclei. They can have a macronucleus, which is going to help regulate their cell's activity, like what their cell does. They also have a micronucleus, and this is going to be important during the reproductive stages of the ciliate. The last protozoa group we want to talk about is the non-modal group, which means that they don't move at all on their own. And this is what we call the sporozoa, or also known as the amcomplexia. These are parasitic and they, they demonstrate a very complex life cycle that involves producing infectious spores. And you can see these infectious spores here. Pneumocytis is a type of pneumonia seen in AIDS patients, which is caused by this group. Plasmodomes that are, pro are protists that are carried by mosquitoes and they cause malaria. And this picture right here is actually showing you what malaria does to your red blood cells. Last is the toxoplasma, which is carried by cats. This is why pregnant women are warned not to clean litter boxes while they're pregnant because an infection of this can cause problems in fetal development. Also, AIDS patients need to be careful around litter boxes because it can also cause neurological problems in them. So this was the last of the protozoa. So let's switch gears to the next group. The next major group of protists is the slime and water moles. These are the fungus-like and they produce spores in a structure called sporangia. During unfavorable environmental conditions, they'll create these. Many are saprotrophs, so they're going to decompose dead material, and this is why they are fungus-like, because fungus does this. But there are a few, if you ingest them, they can be parasitic. Now, slime molds can be plasmodomal, which means that they're structures that, that will actually creep along the ground by way of a slimy sheath, and that's why they get their name slime mold. However, others can be cellular, which means they're going to be microscopic, which you can't see. Now, water molds live in water, and they'll form a furry mass, like you can see here on the object they're decomposing. Now, these are responsible for the potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s. Okay, so that's just a unique fact of the fact that these guys can cause major destruction to crops. Okay, these are the fungus-like. The last group is the plant-like protists, which are also known as algae. These are aquatic autotrophs, so they're going to create their own food, and they contain chlorophyll in a structure called chloroplasts. This is what makes them like plants, because plants have these structures as well. Now, this means they are going to perform photosynthesis. Algae is classified by their predominant pigment and also the composition of their cell wall if it's present. So you can here see here that some of the pigments here are green, others are red, and so on. So we're going to be looking into these groups. First, we have what we call the diatoms. These contain a golden brown pigment. These are the most populous unicellular aquatic algae there is. They are an important source in the food chain when we talk about the marine or water food chain, and they also produce very large amounts of oxygen. Their structure is a box-like structure where they have two valves and one fits on the other like a lid, like a shoebox. Diatome cells have a cell wall composed of silica. The silica is kind of like glass, so they have a glass-like appearance. These are very important economically because they are used as filtering agents, soundproofing materials, and they're also used for abrasives. Dinoflagellates contain a variety of pigments from yellow to green to brown. They also are an important food source in the aquatic food chain. Some live as symbiotes with coral, so they actually will help coral reefs. 
They are motile, which is not real common in algae, and they have two flagella you can see here. And these flagella will whip back and forth to where they move like a spinning top. Now dinoflagellates can cause what we call, call red tides, which you can see in the picture here. Um, this can cause poisoning of shellfish and also fish kills because they produce a really potent neurotoxin when there's a lot of them in the water together. Now guys, the next group is the green algae, and this is what we would normally think of when we think of algae in the sense of it looking like a plant. Green algae is similar to plants because they contain both chlorophyll A and B. They also have a cell wall made out of cellulose, which is similar to plants, and then they can store their, their sugars as starch. There are various degrees of cellular organization in this group. First, we have the unicellular flagellated algae, Chlamydomonas. Others are unicellular filamentous algae, which you see here, which is the spirogyra. So it's like a filament. Volvox is an example of a unicellular colonial green algae. They live in colonies. And then last are the multicellular form, which is called ulva, or we call it like sea lettuce, or this is what you normally think of when you think of green algae. Okay, so this is a green algae group. Now you'll notice that ulva is a multicellular example, whereas the others are all unicellular. So let's talk about some other multicellular groups. Seaweed are the multicellular algae that can be green, red, or brown. Red algaes are associated with warm seawaters and they contribute to the growth of coral reefs, so they're going to be important in coral reefs. They appear to have complex branches to their bodies, but their bodies are feathery, flat, and ribbon-like. They are economically important because they are used to make gelatin-like products for pill coating, so like, like on your Advil or your Motrin or whatever, it has that coating on it that helps you swallow it better that's formed from red algae. Bases of cosmetics, like a lot of um, makeups, are going to have red algae, as well as auger, which is used to grow bacteria in the labs, and of course sushi wrapping. So if you eat sushi, it's, this is the algae that's normally wrapped around the sushi. Brown algae come from a, go, go from simple forms to very complex forms, and these complex forms are what we would call kelp. They can live in more harsh environments like rocky shorelines. Now this is due because they have, they can do this because they have several adaptations that allow them to. First they have what you see down here which are called holdfast. They're almost like roots and they anchor and keep them from being uprooted by tides. They also have air bladders which you can see here which provide buoyancy to these leaf like structures so that they can actually kind of float in the water, okay, up towards where there's light because remember they're doing photosynthesis. They also have like this gel-like coating that prevents them from drying out during low tides, which you can see here in the picture. Um, you can see how it's kind of um, jelly-like substance around it. This is going to help it from drying out. Brown algae are economically important because they are used to make food, such as ice cream and cream cheese. Okay. However, it's kind of strange, but they can also be used for fertilizers. As you can see, this kingdom, Protista, is composed of many diverse groups, going from protozoa, those animal-like, to the fungus, to our algae we see here. So scientists are evaluating their relatedness, and they're evaluating these groups, and pretty soon, guys, this kingdom is going to be split up into multiple kingdoms. You're lucky. You get to learn it as one. In the future, this may be four or five separate kingdoms based on the types of organisms. So remember, this lecture should not take the place of your reading. You need to still read chapter 17, but I hope it helps clear up some problem issues in this chapter. If you have any questions or concerns, please let me know, and have a great day.